What is polyethylene and what's it good for? Polyethylene is the most uh, common plastic that is used. If you look at all the different plastics that are used worldwide, uh, it accounts for about 30-ish percent of all the plastics that are currently used, which is a huge fraction. Um, it comes in different flavors. If you ever see on the bottom of a bottle, something like this that says HDPE, or it says LDPE, or LLDP, these are all different flavors of the same type of polymer. Here's how they differ. We know that the polyethylene polymer has the following monomer. It's these carbons bonded to one another that form the backbone. The repeat unit is one of these, where these are each bonded to hydrogens, right? So it's a C2H4 monomer, and this gets repeated over and over and over. However, every once in a while it might be possible to accidentally end up or intentionally end up with side chains. Maybe you end up with some of these groups going off to the side, right? We call that branching, right? If there are long branches like you see in this one here, you end up with low density polyethylene. And that makes sense because if it was no branches, you could imagine these could stack up really nicely. They could be crystalline, and in fact they do. They actually crystallize into a repeating unit, right? But if they've got these long branches, what's that going to do? This long branch is going to disrupt the ability for this to pack together nice and densely, right? So that leads to a low-density polyethylene. And then you can end up with sort of a medium ground, a what's called a linear low-density polyethylene. So it's essentially short branches instead of long branches. If your branches are just one or two units long, then you end up with short branching, and that's going to be somewhere in between high-density and low-density. And the properties are pretty different. High density, if you have a really rigid bottle like a milk jug, it's probably high density polyethylene. But if it's a more flexible, like this is very flexible bottle, this rubbing alcohol bottle, this is a, and it says right on it, low density polyethylene, LDPE. So it, it's, you can feel it, it's much flimsier, it's not nearly as rigid. And then you can have linear low density, and this is used for things like films, right? Now you can achieve these different things by processing them in different ways. If you extrude the polymer out, and if you're not familiar with extrusion, think of Play-Doh, right? When you squeeze the Play-Doh Play -Doh through some sort of shape, that's essentially how you could make something like these materials, right? If you do it at really high pressures and low temperatures, then you're causing it to get squirted out really quickly, and it doesn't allow it to achieve its lowest energy configuration, which is going to be high density. If you do it under slow, slowly, so at low pressures and high temperatures, so it has lots of thermal energy to line up, it's much more likely to be high density polyethylene, right? And they use this primarily for packaging, bottles, and it's just an incredibly important polymer. Like I said, it makes up about a third of our overall polymers used, and about uh, in the packaging market, about half of packaging is polyethylene. Now, where was it discovered? You can read more about this on the wiki page. It's pretty fascinating. Polyethylene was actually discovered uh, by a pair of Germans in 1898. It was accidental, right? They were actually investigating diazomethanes, and so they called it polymethylene. Um, and it wasn't until 35 years later at the Imperial Chemical Industries where a couple of Englishmen discovered it, and they were actually mixing ethylene and uh, benzaldehyde together, and the machine had a little bit of oxygen present. And that little bit of oxygen was critical because it served as the initiator. So when they tried to reproduce it, uh, they went to very pure conditions. And without that oxygen present, they couldn't reproduce it at first. Um, but it was later that they figured out that, that that initiator was playing an important role. It wasn't until the 50s that you ended up with catalysis that made it uh, industrially viable. At first, they did chromium trioxide, then titanium halides. Later, it was magnesium chlorides. Nowadays, we have really great initiators that allow us to polymerize these ethylene monomers to form long chains in very controlled ways.